Hi, everybody. Hello, hello. Sorry, we had a technical glitch. Um, can get on the call. Uh, happy Friday, everybody. Um, hope everybody's doing well. Um, I know there are lots of conferences going on this weekend, um, so we might have a pretty small group. Um, hey, Nancy, how you doing? Hey, Nancy, how you doing? Oh, Rego, thank you. Thanks for being here today. There we go, there was an echo, perfect. Um, hey, Michael, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Awesome. Um, so the topic for today's um, call was all around generating revenue. Um, and obviously a topic that <laughs> crosses every entrepreneur's mind probably um, every minute of every day at some form or another. So. Um, hopefully we can get into a little bit of a conversation today. Um, hey, Nancy, I might pick on you. <laughs> um, how are you doing? What's been happening? Yeah, Nancy might be on mute. Hi, sorry, it's for me, you're right? Yep, now we can hear you. Perfect. Yeah, so uh, for me, like, you know, uh, I've been like much more before in what design and I just start to launch like my new fashion business. It's all sustainable uh, in Ireland. So I'm much more into like the final phase of launching the project. So I think revenue generation is the right topic because for now I'm like looking on to phase how to, um, uh, there's much more the route to the market and how to generate much more income and revenue off of that, either by partnering with other brands, but it's all the promotional level for now. So it's really in the project uh, development for now and the launch. Mm, gotcha. Nancy, where are you based again? I'm in Dublin, Dublin. Ireland. Oh, Dublin, Ireland. Amazing. <laughs> um, very, very cool. Um, all right. So we can get into some of those, um, you know, maybe focus a little bit on, on your business and kind of where you are. Um, so I will let Michael <laughs> do the fun part. Great, thank you. It's nice to, nice to have everybody here. Uh, so Nancy, let's, it's always good to focus on a specific business when we're talking about some of these revenue issues. So Nancy, tell us a little bit more as, you know, when it comes to revenue, what have been your biggest challenges that you're trying to overcome? I think the biggest challenge was in the beginning what we were trying to raise funds and uh, some grants. So because it didn't see like much more like the profitability of the business. So that was more, more, more or less some of the issues that I think when it's going to be coming because it's all new market, it's all niche. It's very like specific Irish sustainable um, items. So I think where are we seeing like the issues like getting people for pre, pre sale before we launch, for instance. So we have a list of people, but for now it's not really like getting to the way we want yet. And what are the main, what are the main tools that you're using to reach them? 
Uh, so basically we have an email list and we also have a, like a Facebook groups. And then we were trying to organize some events as well and planning to get like, you know, much more crowdfunding as well. Just trying to spread more the words, make sure that before we launch, we're not overproducing. So we get the right um, public before we know exactly how much we need to produce, for instance. Um, tell me a little bit more about your, your products and services. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. So basically it's covered like male and women, like, you know, undergarment from like underwears to t-shirts. And then some of them is more like um, socks as well. And some of them are really like, you know, design wise, really like specific to Irish market. So everything is like in a, the Irish culture, much more bringing it to the modern way type of it. And then some of them are much more like funky and pop rock. And then we got a more like natural and classic trying to have like three different type of public as well. Gotcha. So do you see this as something that just, um is offered within the irish market yeah there is a big gap there because like there are other companies doing that you know very like specific irish souvenir irish items but then the quality are very quite poor none of them are sustainable so then there are other companies doing like irish clothing but they're just too widespread so we're trying to bring this into a niche market combining how we can use the cultural patterns to make it more modern but also being ethical and also sustainable as well. Gotcha. And um, are those the pillars that you're using to kind of differentiate yourself that the quality and also the sustainability of it? Um, the, and then the design and the price as well, because they are very really highly priced. So we're trying to make much more like affordable price as well. And then the public we're targeting as kind of quite young, starting between like 20, late twenties into 35 years old, for instance. Yep. Um, what was it that ultimately um, had you identify this niche as and this product as something that was needed? Uh, yeah, sure. Because like it happened like to me, like I was like much more like starting like you know sourcing to buy much more like um, um, much more like you know souvenir. Like when I was like because I'm from Paris originally, so when I moved here like about years ago eight years now, when I was going back, people was asking me to buy like souvenir for Highland and something very specific Irish. And then some of them love clothing. So when I was trying to buy them, it's always the same type of products, mainly made in China. It's either too big, too, too small. And then the quality was like really like bad after a few months. So they keep on asking me. And then I was like trying to locate this um, special souvenir. And then I realized that like, there is a pool design as well. And then People are looking for this product always or Christmas, but then the quality is not yet made there, but there is a big market, let's say, not only in Ireland, but in the US and Australia, for instance. Gotcha, gotcha. So you identified through your own experience as a market niche where there was a gap um, and you saw the opportunity to, to go ahead and fill that gap. Okay, great. So that's really good context. So I wanted to pick on someone else. So, and I'm, maybe I'm saying this wrong, uh, Slack, C Slack, I see. Um, you want to say hello? Mm. And maybe I'm getting the name wrong. Yeah, I think you're right. Oops. Hi, hey. hello. Hi, good morning. Good morning, how are you? Good, so tell us um, where you are and tell us a little bit about your business. Um, I'm based in the Northeast in uh, New York um, and I'm in the... Uh, infancy stages of uh, looking at starting something up and um, um, value added products in food products. In any particular arena? Um, still trying to explore. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, cool. Well, nice to have you. Uh, you know, I think that, um, uh, Nancy, when you think about, you know, I'm just kind of asking for more details about the business because, you know, one of the most important things when it comes to revenue generation is, as we like to say, finding a playground where nobody else is playing. And I think that um, if you think of the world as a highly cluttered world um, and there's competition, you know, uh, different businesses and websites and the like pop up everywhere. Um, and as we think about, you know, Nancy, you're a little bit further along, was you think about, okay, what kind of business we are going to start and, and what kind of market can we target? A lot of time it comes from the fact that you have this, this need that pops up. So Nancy, obviously, you know, we all know kind of some of the, the more traditional kind of souvenir world, right? Um, and you're saying, hey, I don't think that is the quality of people. People want things that are 
based on Irish culture, but it's just not meeting the need, right? Um, in terms of the niche. So the most important thing of all of this, when we talk about the topic of today's talk, which is revenue, um, is, about, is about finding this playground, right? It is about ultimately finding the spot where you're, as we like to think of it, almost like the only game in town, right? How do you define a place where you're identified as the only one? Now, that's extreme, right? Because we can always say, for example, use you again, Nancy, and we can always say, well, there's lots and lots of people that do this. But, but as you mentioned before, you know, Facebook groups, email lists, that's a, those are all things that everybody uses, right? So when everybody uses all of those tools, the question is, why would somebody come to any one particular organization? And this is against the backdrop of us living in a super cluttered world, right? So it's not like people define a, a, a buying decision and say, I'm going to compare service one to service two, right? Um, they don't take the time to do that. They're hit with clutter all day long of email and, and, and ads on social and the like. And so you really have to figure out, okay, what is that place where it's just me? And it's not always going to be purely just you, but it's a really good perspective to have. So Nancy, let's, let's go back to you again. When you think about how you define that, right? You really want to say, you know, the criteria for buying something like this should be quality and sustainability, and you shouldn't buy anything else other than things that have these things, right? Because you're trying to say, I'm selling apples and everybody else is selling oranges. And that's what's people, but that's what makes people understand, right? That, oh, okay, this is different and I will pay attention and I will, I will cut through all the clutter that exists out there, okay? And so you really have to kind of reinforce that playground where nobody, where nobody else is playing. Other things that you can do to do that, right, is, is what we kind of call know-how, right? Um, know-how meaning um, knowing something about your particular area or niche that's very insightful to your buyer. Okay. And, and part of that know-how just comes from your experience of doing it. So, um, you know, part of how, how you communicate around whatever product or service you're using, because remember, there's always a, a, a cheaper product or service, right? So do you bring some kind of know-how or intelligence around your product or service that really makes the buyer go, oh, they really understand this. They, they add value to what I'm, what I'm trying to do. One of the ways that we can, we can add to that know-how is another technique when it comes to revenue generation, which is uh, building upon things that people already know and believe. You know, what's hard, right, is to convince people of something completely new, right? What's easier is building upon something that they already know and believe. So Nancy, I'll use your, yours as an example. Pretty much everybody knows and believes that when it comes to souvenirs, they're exactly what you said. They're cheap, right? They're knockoffs. They're from made in foreign countries, right? You can build upon that and say, well, that's all this other stuff, right? And we're doing it this way. So as everyone can probably tell, what I'm not really talking about is social media ads or email marketing or events. Those are the channels into which you push your products and services, okay? But remember, everybody's using those channels. And because everybody's using those channels, what is it that makes it different? What makes it different is, do I have a playground where nobody else is playing? Am I bringing a certain type of know-how to the table that makes the buyer go, oh, wow, these people know a lot about it? Um, am I building upon these ideas, right, that people already believe, right? And if I do that, you, can, you help to connect with them uh, conceptually so they walk away with an idea in their head that you are different, okay? The, the development of differentiation doesn't happen by detail these days. The world is too cluttered. And as, as I like to say, many of you heard me use this analogy before, when you buy a car, you don't walk around to the driver's side and open up the glove compartment and read the manual, right? 
That's not how people buy. And in this day and age, the world is too cluttered. We don't have the time to do all that. What we latch onto is products and services that we go, oh yeah. And that, and that oh yeah, makes us want to open up the car manual, right? And that oh yeah comes from finding this playground. It comes from bringing a certain type of know-how to the table, right? That other people don't have. Um, it comes from building upon these themes, right? That uh, that people already already know and believe. Okay, so when you think about the topic of today, which is revenue, yes, there's a whole bunch of execution that that has to happen to to get this out there. But I can tell you that if you go into these traditional marketing channels without something where you're going to give yourself the opportunity to say, oh yeah, that's different. It becomes very, very difficult and very, very expensive to, to cut through. Okay, so let's, um, uh, Eden, is that how you pronounce your name? Eden, I think you're on mute. If hey you're Eden, how you doing? Welcome, great to see you here. Hi, sorry, I'm driving, so I was trying to unmute myself. <laughs> and not crash. No, no, we don't want that. Eden, where are you based? Yeah. Um, Orlando, Florida. Great. Um, Eden, can you tell us a little bit about your business? Yes. Yeah, so um, I was actually on a call a couple of calls ago, but I have started a an online directory for um, eyelash and brow artists. Oh, right, that, right, right. I remember now. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm in the, the stage basically where I'm building a website and um, an email list. So wow. that's where I am. I remember now. So, so let's take, so, so Nancy, and, and let's take the same concepts we were talking about with your business and apply it to Eden's business. So Eden, when you, um, when you developed that business, how is it that you came about uh, the identification of that need? I was on social media and um, Instagram to be exact, and I saw that there there's so many um, people who do who actually provide this service, and they are primarily using social media to promote their business. And I thought, what if there was a, an easier way, or maybe a more I don't know if it's easier, but cohesive um, place for these particular um, businesses to be found. And I thought of like Yelp in a sense, but strictly for this one industry. Gotcha. So that was, yeah, the idea. So, so it's really interesting, right? Because when we talk about finding a playground where nobody else is playing, it doesn't have to be a new product or service. It doesn't have to be a niche like Nancy you're identifying. It can be just the way a market's organized, right? Um, you know, the, I'll give you an example. Back a bunch of years ago, uh, Thomson Reuters, big information company, went out and took all the documents that existed in courthouses through the country and did it, digitized them and put them all in a platform, right? So all it did was take the market that existed already. You could go to your local courthouse and get a document, right? Um, and organize it differently. And that's, you know, even kind of what you're doing. You're saying, listen, there's all of these independent folks doing this on their own, right? Um, and they don't necessarily have tools and mechanisms to do it more efficiently, buy product more efficiently, learn from each other, maybe be supported by marketing. You know, if you almost think about the way fran franchises work, right? Franchises, they give somebody a franchise, but then they also provide marketing support and other types of things. Because right now you have a market, right? That is very disjointed and disintegrated and probably right even if i get you correctly they're all doing their own thing right right and that's incredibly inefficient but imagine they could um, buy the materials they need to, pr to provide the service imagine instead of buying it just for them where it's really expensive they could take advantage of buying that happened through the whole network that you're building right, right? or they're all building their own websites, right? There are solutions out there that when you join these networks, you can spin up a website in two seconds because you create a framework for them to actually do that. And now all of a sudden, you might be in a 
subscription business, right? Where you provide a subscription service to these various folks that, that you're providing them the foundation, right? For building out products and services to serve these markets. Yes, and that's, that's exactly um, what I'm building is, is a subscription service yep. for them, yeah. So, so I think the reason that I'm, I'm digging in this a little bit with everybody here is, is, you know, in Nancy, in your case, your, your playground is defined by, you know, this whole idea that everybody knows that kind of souvenir stuff is kind of junky and you, you've carved a niche and Eden, you're, you're taking a market and your playground is the fact that there's this whole market out there that is serving people. Um, but they're just doing it in all as kind of independent folks every single one of them is building a website. Every single one of them is right. Spending time and money and effort on trying to do basically the same thing. Um, and so if you can give them the foundation for that, that's, you know, that is meeting the criteria I said before, which everybody on this call would say, yeah, that makes sense. Right. And that's something that I would invest in, buy from and the like, um, Ian, in your, and so I, I want to make sure that, that, people understand that a lot of times, especially when you talk to people that are here about your businesses, um, you know, Eden, you had mentioned, you know, you did social media and this, like, like a lot of times people focus on the tactical things, building a website, email marketing, digital marketing, you know, and ultimately it's what you put, you've heard me say this before, but it's what you put into those channels that make a difference. Right. And so thinking through, right? Finding your niche, finding your playground where somebody goes, yeah, that's what they do. And that's how that's different. That becomes the foundation for all success when it comes to revenue, because there's always somebody that's going to do something cheaper. There's always somebody that there's always going to be competition across the board. That's never going to be avoidable, right? Um, the key is how do I take this niche and this differentiation that's defined by a, a different playground, defined by know-how, defined by you know, building upon things that people already know, you know, some of the techniques that I've been talking about here. Um, uh, how do you take that and then start to craft the messaging that really makes people go, yeah, across the different marketing channels that you ultimately like to use? Okay. Um, let me stop there for anybody. Um, anybody have any questions? I think you're answering them as, as we're going. Gotcha. Um, so I think, I think as we think about um, how does this stuff come to life in marketing channels, um, resist the temptation to tell everybody everything about your product or service, right? you've got to get them to that aha moment where they understand why it's different and valuable. And once they get there, then all the details can, can follow, right? People buy on concepts these days, right? They buy, Oh, okay. This is the, these are the souvenirs that are higher quality and environmentally conscious. Okay. That's them. Right. And if that appeals to them, that's, those are the conversations you want to be having. Okay, those are the fights you want to fight is, is un somebody understanding that that's what you do. Once you do that, you can say them, Nancy, like you had said before, well, we have different sizes, we have different this, we have different this, we have different that, right? Um, and too many times people move directly to the nature of the products and services, right? As opposed to the unique place that you're operating in the world. Okay, so... Uh, said a little bit differently, um, imagine if you were doing uh, wealth management, for example. Well, what people do in wealth management um, is largely the same. But if you were saying, I do wealth management specifically for the Latinx community, because there's very unique needs in those communities, which includes you know, X and Y and Z, and there's a unique know-how that goes with that, right? Then all of a sudden, somebody goes, well, if I'm interested in um, wealth for the Latin community, this is the place to go. And hopefully defines them as an N of one, like there's only one of them, when another organization 
right, might say, we do wealth management for everybody, and they go, a, you know, A, B, C, D, E, including Latin, right? And, and so, but they're not bringing to the table any kind of know-how, right, or things people already believe about Latin that would make them go, oh, I want to go there, right? So there's many of those, and that's not to say that, that you couldn't dig in further and learn that what they were doing for the Latin community is, is different. But in a, again, the world of clutter, people never get to that. They go, oh, okay, it's a wealth management firm like, like everybody else. Whereas the other one that might bring a piece of know-how to the table specifically about, in my example, Latin community. So I'll give you an example from my old business healthcare. We were helping a company that had provided wellness solutions, you know, help people with heart disease and diabetes. And, and they, were, they were struggling to stand out amongst um, a lot of other health and wellness businesses. And I started to ask them a little bit about, tell me where you've had some success and what's worked. And they talked about how they did some programs for health plans that support that was basically targeted to the Latinx community. And I was like, well, tell me a little bit more about that. And it turns out that, that in health and wellness, that there were a couple of things that made a really big impact that were different in the Latin community. Uh, one was religion, that um, if their religious leaders told them to do something, it was much more likely they would do it because religion played such a large role. And the other was transportation. And some of these communities is very difficult for people. They didn't, it's not they didn't wanna to go to healthcare facilities, they just couldn't get there. And so that know-how, instead of being one detail of many about how to put in place effective health and wellness solutions, we said to them, no, that has to be your lead. You have to show them how you have a unique understanding of this market. And so they switched their strategy and started to really focus on that community and to focus on that community with those pieces of know-how really front and center. Okay. And all of a sudden their business started to grow because they got to be known as, oh, these are the folks that really specialize in that, in that community. Okay. So those are the things that you have to bring to the table and, and stand out. Right. And the applications of those things might be different in your different businesses. Right. So for example, even in your business, when somebody says, well, why should I go with these guys? certainly you're providing a foundation of a platform and all this other stuff, which makes great sense to them. But you also might say to them, remember, if you don't do this right, or you don't do this right, or you don't get purchasing power, or you don't service your clients these ways, it becomes very difficult to compete, right? You're bringing a, a know-how about the, the, I don't want to say the right way to do it, but a more informed way to do it, that an independent person that did this on their own might not have known, right? So imagine there's a service that's completely competitive with yours, right? So it does exactly what you do, you do. Why is it somebody would go with you versus going with them? Well, the reason it, they would go with you is because you bring know-how and insight about the way that those services are delivered that ultimately will help them grow their businesses faster, okay? So you really have to pull out these nuggets for your business. And, and my message here is they have to be front and center, right? They can't be the second and third and, and fourth things that people get to, because honestly, people will never get to those unless you give them a reason to. Okay, I would imagine, Eden, I am hardly an expert in the area, but I would imagine that there are unique things about delivering those services, everything from buying, right, the materials to the way that you deliver it that are very specific, that if you haven't done it, right, there's a lot of risk in you and you're not delivering the services correctly, right? Right. Yes, exactly. Okay. Now, Nancy, that might be slightly different for you, right? You just the way that you're going in. And frankly, um, part of the other element of this, which I haven't talked about yet, um, is who you sell it to, right? Um, a lot of times a service sold to one set of customers doesn't work when the same exact service set to set sold to a different set of customers does work. Okay. So, so Nancy, you might have buyers, for example, that are value buyers, buyers that buy, you know, based on price, right? I'm going to buy a t-shirt. I'm going to buy this based on price, but maybe that's not your buyer. Maybe your buyer is one that's more affluent, right? Who is interested in, you know, many people that I think that are buying souvenirs don't think about sustainability, right? 
um, how are you thinking about who is the appropriate buyer for my products and services? Okay, and that becomes a way to say, okay, um, maybe my playground is based on who I ultimately sell something to. You, can, you could offer a service to one group and I'll, I'll focus on price, not that price is the only thing. You could focus on selling something to a, a group and for one group, the price of your product might be super, super inexpensive. And for another group, it might be way too expensive. Okay, so Nancy, for you, I think you have to really give some thought to, you know, who am I targeting? Right, because I would imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, that the price point might be maybe it's higher, which is fine as long as you don't sell it to people whose main criteria is just purely value as opposed to like you said, quality and, and sustainability. Okay, does the, and Nancy, does that make sense? Oh, definitely. I think it's a good point. And when you are talking about, you know, who are you selling to? And that's we really make me challenge the way I was like offering the product. So not being only geared into the souvenir, I was like wondering like, not everybody would like to buy any like, you know, flashy and fancy, really custom, well-designed Irish products. How I'm going to do to capture all this, all the customer looking for Irish products, but they have value. So that's why I was trying to diversify the line, having a much more like not neutral and also normal like, product that going to be Irish made. But then the one purpose souvenir with special design as well, trying to capture all these people. That was the biggest challenge because then the more I was designing, I was like, well, I need to extend as well, making sure that I'm not only super, super, only um, focusing on the super, super niche of the souvenir, but trying to capture all these people. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Yeah, you know, a lot of times the same product or service sold to different markets work. So I'll, I'll give you an example. There's a lot of things that, that when they're offered, when somebody in, in healthcare goes to a big company like a, like a health plan, right? Like in the US, you know, Aetna and Cigna and Nancy over there, probably Bupa, right? And some of the other health plans over, they go to these big companies and they offer them a technology solution to, you know, help people manage their diabetes or whatever it may be. And the health plans are big and, and very um, sophisticated. And so the, the criteria of what you have to <clears throat> deliver is enormous. But if you take that same solution and you sell it to smaller healthcare companies, right? That solution might be perfectly fine, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. A, a friend of mine's brother, um, this is many years ago, had met uh, some trainers in a gym and the trainers had developed this little technology application to help you manage your workouts. Now, we all know today there's tons and tons of these and they're really sophisticated. And they said, wow, we've come up with this, this really neat way to manage your workouts you know, through mobile devices and things like that. And they came to me because I knew somebody and I said, you know, all due respect, there's a million of these. There's a million of these applications that already exist out there. Um, you could just go online and Google them and you'd see them all over the place. This is about, you know, seven or eight years ago. And I was like, tell me more about your business. And it turned out that they knew the people at GNC, which is a big United States retailer. It sells vitamins and other types of things. And they were very interested and GNC, despite being a kind of a healthcare chain, was not somebody that was very active in the US healthcare system. You don't hear about GNC often, that often, but they had these stores all over the place. Um, and GNC didn't really have a health and wellness play. So we were like, go to GNC and offer them to offer this platform to all of their customers. For GNC, it became very differentiating because they were not playing where everybody else is playing. So they took the same product that frankly, wasn't as good as a lot of other products that are out there, but because they had a relationship and they could, because they had a certain type of buyer, right? All of a sudden that became of great value to GNC and they signed a big deal with them and, and they took off from there. Okay, I'll give you one other example. Um, it's a lot of who you sell it to. Um, a, a young man from MIT had developed some gaming technology that allowed you to bet on a lot of different sporting events. Um, and when we got a chance to interact with him, he said, well, it's more sophisticated and use artificial intelligence and X, Y, and Z. So he went to the big players here in the United States, DraftKings, right? And he said, you know, you should use my technology. You guys are using old, even though you're the big, the 800 pound gorilla, you're using old, old technology and it's not gonna work and blah, blah, blah. 
So um, DraftKings was like, okay, that's fine, but we're DraftKings. And you know, he was frustrated by the fact that he knew their technology was older and needed to be revamped, but that, and he had this new age technology, but they were still the, the 800 pound gorilla. And he said, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna beat them. And we're like, you're not gonna beat them because they have a $2 billion valuation, right? And lots of money. I was like, but is there another market segment that could benefit from your platform? Well, it turns out that if you think about Las Vegas, the Las Vegas casinos had really gotten hit hard because before you used to have to travel to Las Vegas to bet on a sporting event. And you didn't have to do that anymore because throughout the country, you had all these ways to do it. But the Las Vegas casinos were really struggling with how are we going to compete with the draft with DraftKings? So go to Las Vegas casinos and say, we're going to give you technology. We'll give you technology tomorrow that will instantaneously allow you to compete with the people that are essentially your competitors. And they got great receptivity because that market needed a technology play. Same product. Okay. Just sold to a different market. Okay. So when each of you think about, you know, who you're offering your products and services to, part of it is the playground, right? Um, part of it is, uh, the know-how part of it is, you know, building on things people know, you know, the techniques I was mentioning before, but part of it is also who you sell it to and really thinking that, that being specific about who really is going to benefit. Um, I can't tell you how many times people go in front of investors and an investor will say, who is your customer? And the answer will be something to, in the form of, well, my customers, everybody's my customer. And investors just completely tune out to that because they understand that, that in carving someone's path to success, you have to go win a market. You have to go win a piece. And if you just try to offer it to every single market, especially at early stages when you don't have all the people and you don't have all the capital that you need, it's almost impossible to do as opposed to going and winning a very, very specific market, even a smaller market than you would ultimately want. And then building upon that to extend it to, to other markets. Okay, so let me stop there. Anybody have any, any questions? Because that's the stuff that I really wanted to cover today is these techniques that you think about as you go back into your, into your business. Anybody have any questions? I was just gonna say the point about um, that you touched on, right? We, we talk about this. Um, you can't chase every customer, right? And as it re relates to generating revenue, um, that was great because I feel like entrepreneurs were often, oh, there's a customer here, a customer there, and not yeah, necessarily yeah. think whether or not we're selling to the, right, focusing on the right kind of channels and customers. Yeah, and it goes a little bit to Nancy's point about you have to create, when you're, ch when you're chasing every customer, you have to create all different products and services and sales processes and manufacturing and, right? right it takes away your focus and what you're, what you're yeah. trying to do. Because remember, any customer set we go after, there's going to be challenges. Yep. It's not that there's not challenges. It's just that you get deeper into those challenges and you start to understand better how to, how to weave through them. Right. No, this has been great. Very insightful and, uh, and great talking points. Well, I hope everybody can take away some of these uh, techniques. Does anybody have any other questions before we, before we wrap up? Cool. Well, you guys know where to find us um, and, and hopefully uh, you guys can take some tidbits away. You can uh, use these in your businesses. So have a terrific, uh, terrific Friday. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Friday and a great weekend. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.